had a pretty large bang associated with the um, caution and warning them. Okay. As we have an apparent serious oxygen leak. Hello and welcome to Failure to Launch, the space history podcast where we walk you through all the mistakes, failures, and explosions that made modern space exploration possible. We are your hosts, Quinn. Chris. A shook Chris. And today we are rejoined by Tanner and Taylor of the Beyond the Breakers podcast to continue our series on Soyuz 11. Welcome back, everyone. How are we all feeling? Great. Glad to be here. Hell yeah. Good. Thanks for having us back to, to finish things off here. I'm doing just fine. Great, but I have a feeling the it's going to go downwards. Well, we did say that it, it was rising to a peak last time. And I mean, I, I kind of debated the use of the word peak. I think it's just going to keep going, you know, and just up forever. But I did, I did want to ask that, how's everyone feeling? I normally ask that at the end, but um, I want to have a succinct before and after for this one. I'm feeling great because I found an amazing thing this morning. It's the NFL Global Markets Program. Oh, is that where they have basically divided up the world like the Treaty of Tordesillas? Yeah, about, they're like, different like teams? colonizing. Mm-hmm. The different teams are colonizing different yeah. countries. And <laughs> how does the National Football League have global? How does anything national have global? I don't know, but I have put it into the insertion <laughs> chat and all I can look at. Don't tell the audience that exists. They'll want in on our discord. <laughs> they don't know. But I'm just staring at the North Irish IRA, just Steelers balaclava, and I have a need. Wait, so so what actually <laughs> is this? Because now I'm very curious. It's it's like a it's like a new marketing campaign to try to make the game more of a global game. Yeah. Okay. It's like a very, so there's like assigned like, territories to different teams where they can go yeah. and develop. <laughs> do, do, do those territories get a choice of what team they get? Like, Not what if really. it's a shit team? Uh, wait a second. <laughs> the uh, T- talking about that, though, uh, Northern Ireland gets uh, exclusive access in the UK, you know, world to the Steelers, which are only allocated to Ireland, which does make sense. Oh, because, that, OK. You know, so they- <laughs> oh, and <laughs> the yeah. Steelers are pro unification of Ireland. Hold up, hold up. Mexico gets the Steelers, too. Well, which Rooney was it? Was it was it Dan Rooney? Who's the who was the ambassador to Ireland? Yeah, one of them was the ambassador to Ireland. Under, they have a lot of Obama. connections, I think. There. OK, so so they do try and make some tenuous little connections. Uh, yes, the NFL saying 26 plus six equals one and really, you know, forgetting things. Mm-hmm. Oh, I don't know how to resp- I don't know how to riff off of that. I don't know enough about geopolitics and I don't know enough about football. Uh, things are bad. All I know well, is that I would like things. it would be a geopolitical incident if the NHL did that because I would not wish the senators on like anyone. <laughs> Why is it like, Nigeria? like if, we're, if we're doing fucking like foreign aid and that foreign aid is exclusively sends jerseys, use it as kindling. Don't. try and run a car on it chris can you explain to me why nigeria is the only one and only has the option for the browns what those poor poor people because the nfl is an organization that delights in the misery of others i like that they gave the saints to france because french things are from new orleans yeah Yeah, like oh like a fleur-de-lis yeah (laughs) i mean that's just obvious but and also columbia getting the dolphins come on (laughs) <laughs> i didn't know that first ever nfl game i went to was just for dolphins <laughs> depending on when that happened that could have been a rough game it was a rough game i witnessed many acts of violence that day <laughs> nice it was great the tailgating not the violence so time to time to veer that mood everybody's got some good moods everyone's got some good fun things coming into this um we're gonna crush them and it's going to it's going to lead in slow. Also, like uh, for all I joke, uh, audience, if you listen to the Bondarenko episodes and did not enjoy that, we are getting to something of that level later. Uh, so just be aware if you want to listen to part the part of this that is fun and is funny. I will call out that kind of content warning later. But yeah, we are going to be talking about Salute 1. So use 11, that whole kind of story again. 
Um, if you have not listened to part one, I'd highly recommend going uh, back and listening to that. Now, like with last time, I'm going to be sourcing uh, Salyut, Triumph and Tragedy by Grzyka Ivanovich and volume four of Soviet engineer Boris Chertok's memoirs, Rockets and People. Uh, as always, all links will be down below in the show notes. Recap. Now, in the last part, the Soviets had lost the moon race and decided to pivot into manned space stations, creating the Salyut program. Uh, notably, what the main Soviet Space Bureau, OKB-1, did was steal components from OKB-52's military space station program, Almaz. Uh, so we talked about this last time. This kicks off the whole corporate war that is still going on today. And basically, by stealing a couple of almost complete stations and taping on some spare Soyuz spacecraft parts, OKB-1 was able to cobble together a station that sort of worked within a year, which, in fairness, is a huge accomplishment, if it works. There was also all kinds of drama and politics around the crew selection, people being nixed for getting divorced, wearing glasses, being Jewish, and the victimless brackets one victim crime of hitting someone with your car, uh, that kind of stuff. Ah, yes, the wonders of drinking and driving. Thank you, buddy. I feel like that's barely a misdemeanor in the Soviet Union at the time. <laughs> I think still the glasses is funniest because it's like we don't want any nerds on our spaceship. All right. This is for the cool. This is for the cool kids. Only. What it sounds like the NBA off? before the 1950s. Like, I mean, at the same time, the cosmonauts also got very nice aerodynamic cars. So I feel like, you know, getting hit by like a blocky uh, <laughs> Soviet, get, I'm uh, getting hit by like a Zis uh, limousine, a ZIS would like it would just mulch you getting hit by Yuri Gagarin's um, like French sports car. He's dying. It would either slice you clean in half um, or it would just like, you know, you would slide cleanly over the top because it's so smooth for it. For a second, it would almost feel nice. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Getting hit by Yuri Gagarin's sports car is like a moose test kind of situation. Your legs get knocked out and then you're just in the cabin with him. Oh, cool. You're with Yuri Gagarin. Yeah, you and just he's, slide he's, he's, in there. Yeah, would he, would he sign something for you, I hope? Yeah. He, <gasps> Yuri Gagarin, can I have your autograph? He's going to sign your full body cast. You yes. say through like a, a, like your face is just broken, your teeth are shattered, you've got blood coming out. <laughs> well, we were, at, uh, we were at a golf tournament one time. This is a long time ago, and we got to see Tiger Woods hit somebody with his drive. Absolutely. Squared him up. Yeah. Dude, nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah well and then because that's like the closest i've ever been to tiger woods so i remember it but like he walks over and he like i think he like signed a glove and a ball uh, for him he or also something gave him his like watch which was probably a rolex oh, or something so. <laughs> well that too <laughs> we call this the settle it out of court maneuver <laughs> <laughs> yeah just inscri inscribed on the back of that watch is just like loads of very fine print legalese of like you can no longer sue me it it's actually an nda just accepting the watch automatically you've agreed yeah. to it <laughs> where'd you get that watch tiger woods is like lawyer is leaning out from behind the corner <laughs> staring wet, daggers at you. Finger at you <laughs> if this were baseball they would rule it fan interference and kick him out of the of of the uh the game there so that sucks <laughs> man what what the hell when did they make that a rule I think that's been a rule for a while. I think if they rule fan interference, you get kicked out of the game. I think so. I'm frankly yeah, amazed. Like my my with my uh, my experience of sports is mostly hockey, and I'm amazed. Like the netting isn't up. It's mostly just up around both ends at the net. Like for if a if a, a shot goes high, I'm amazed more people haven't gotten like fucking killed uh, with a fucking puck hitting their head just if it goes off at the sides. Because I can't believe that it wasn't weird to me that they didn't used to have netting. Like that didn't even yeah. seem weird back in the day. Yeah. Like a puck can't get airborne. <laughs> I remember what I was going to say now. The difference <laughs> between getting hit by just like, well, yeah, like you said, like regular limo with, with its squared front. Would you rather have like your entire chest cavity crumpled or would you rather have like your legs below the knee shattered by Yuri Gagarin's <laughs> low riding sports car? <laughs> We we've returned we've returned to that you know we all all these cars these days are too big and monomolecular mm -hmm. edges yeah yeah, yeah well, no, it's, it's, just... it's it, no it, it's like I wish we had monomolecular edges the cut would be so clean imagine how easy it would be to put your feet back on <laughs> yeah, you know? just the nerves line up perfectly today it's like you got cars <laughs> bigger than people and so when they the strike zone is like your upper body you just get slammed you know dude I wish we had a car smaller than a person that would like a person could. I guess that would just be for children. A vehicle, a vehicle that's <laughs> shorter than a person, I'm assuming, is what you're going for, which is like what cars used to be like. 
Okay, you meant height. I meant volume. Uh, well, all right, but I mean, um, I don't have a way to segue, so I'm just going to say segue. Where we had last left off, the Soyuz 10 mission, planned to be the first to enter and live in a space station, had failed spectacularly after they broke their docking port and only managed to escape by hot wiring their spacecraft. Um, so this was the docking pin we talked about last time. It got snapped. It it didn't get snapped. Crucially, they were able to escape with it intact. Oh, oh, they did. Yes, <laughs> it was bent. It was not snapped. It was, bruised. It was bent. <laughs> So, yeah, while the crew made it to the ground safely and Soviet propaganda was able to play it off as a win, Soyuz 10 was still considered a big failure. Worse, they didn't know what kind of damage had been done to the station. The crew didn't have spacesuits, so they couldn't go out and check. And the docking hardware of the Soyuz was ditched and burned up on reentry. So, like, they had no data. It would fall to the next mission, Soyuz 11, to inspect the station. And if it looked okay, dock with it. And that mission, the lead up, the events, and the fallout, is what we are going to be talking about today. Lessons learned from Soyuz 10. Now, the first thing to happen after Soyuz 10 was talk of redesigns, both to the Soyuz spacecraft and the overall mission. Uh, because of how rushed the Salyut station had been, the engineers who worked on the docking port had a pretty good idea of what the problems were. This is the eight potential problems that they rattled off last time. <laughs> So it's not necessarily that these were huge surprises. They they knew about these problems. They just didn't have time to fix them because of how huge of a rush job everything in this program was, which, you know, I've worked on programs like that. Sometimes unfinished products get shipped. That's like that's like 90 percent of aerospace. Uh, same for mine. Band-aid solutions until the proper one can be put in place. He worked on F-35s. <laughs> uh, no, it's just <laughs> every helicopter's engine. It, it's a I recurring don't theme to me that the Soviets really love rushing their space program. It does seem hurried. Hold that thought. Also, <laughs> so this is another thing. Um, we talk, we're talking about rushes and whatnot. Soyuz 10 launched at the end of April 1971, and Soyuz 11 is scheduled to launch for the start of June. Uh, so that wow. is one month in, in which to solve a shitload of engineering problems and get a new, tr uh, get a new crew ready. I keep like thinking back to just the fact that like they're being launched up there to first check and make sure everything looks okay and then dock if possible yeah i wouldn't like being launched into space if i didn't know for sure i could attach to the thing i needed to attach to especially whenever you consider that the uh the checking if it's okay is you look out a window and see if it looks kind of good you're almost a mannequin at that point you're just being yelled at by the silly mission <laughs> i'll hold that thought all right great so while that is going on on the engineering side, Vasily Mission, the new head of OKB-1, started, uh, he proposed a change to the mission, but I'm Tish, whatever. And this is, this is actually something that, like, this is a good idea. Mission occasionally has good ideas. Because they didn't know if the station had been damaged when Soyuz-10 tried to dock, he wanted to launch two cosmonauts wearing spacesuits instead of three cosmonauts without. Quote, once the rendezvous had been accomplished, the spacecraft would park alongside Salyut and one of the cosmonauts would don his suit and exit the orbital module in order to inspect the station's docking mechanism. He would then cross the gap and by gripping onto a series of handles on the surface of the station, make his way along to the area of the science module and open the cover that had failed to release immediately after the station reached orbit. Um, so this is something else that I forgot to talk about last time. The Salyut station, like most of the interior, is actually filled up by this huge, like, pillar of scientific equipment. And it goes to outside and it has this uh, giant lens cap about, like, five feet across, the, through which all of this scientific equipment is going to look at the stars and the Earth and whatnot. Um, whenever it launched, that lens cap didn't deploy. So their, their proposal is, on top of doing a spacewalk to check if the damage has been done, this guy's just going to go over and try and, like, lever it off by hand. So you're saying they're just going to deploy an astronaut out into space. My yeah. boy is going to have to whip out a crowbar and just crack this thing open. <laughs> yes. And if he can't crack it open, uh, if they don't do this plan, if they don't get this lens cap off, then all of the station's scientific stuff is just mostly useless. I, I love that the Soviets treat um, this kind of stuff like it's a tractor. Like everything yeah. is just like hit it with a hammer. Just, just, just hit it. Like every civilization comes back to something. Like there's a base factor, and it's starting to seem like in this case it might be just tractors. Just hit it with them. Just hit it again. I have a brainworm of the docking procedure because it didn't work the first time, right? Yeah. 
that he's out in space and he's just pulling the two crafts together with his arms. <laughs> he just has to like <laughs> try and manually line it up. Well, just to himself inside the suit yelling, just kiss. Left, yeah. right. I'm just thinking of that one scene in whatever movie, whatever whatever Avengers movie it was where Chris Evans is like pulling the helicopter and he's oh, flexing. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> that, but it's good. Alexei Leonov, yeah. <laughs> He could do it. I uh, oh, I'm thinking of him built. having like uh, getting getting on the side of the module. He's got like both feet planted on either side of the cap and just like <laughs> yanking on this yeah. thing and getting it off and just rocketing out into space <laughs> along with it. Now, as weird and stupid as this plan sounds, it does bring us to an important point for this story. Soyuz cosmonauts did not wear spacesuits, not even the kind of pressure suits normally worn today during launch. Instead, they wore gray cotton flight suits. It's got to be comfortable, though. God dang it. It is. Yeah, it's super comfortable. And the spacecraft are so reliable, you would never need spacesuits. This is the key thing. Well, yeah. What do you take us for? Some capitalist menace? Well, ho- actually, hold that thought. I mother... Because I need to be fair. I need to be fair. The first Voskhod missions also got rid of spacesuits to save space in the capsule. For the first four years of the shuttle program, astronauts also just wore flight suits. It was only after Challenger that NASA decided to start uh, like giving them pressure suits. So this is more in the line of just like space programs only learning things through mistakes. <laughs> and they only learn it through their mistakes because NASA saw what happened to the Soviets and they were just like, couldn't happen to us. And then... 15 years later, it happened to us. Would pressure suits have helped on Challenger? No. <laughs> I was going to ask the same thing, and I think I assumed that answer. <laughs> I, it, would, it would not have helped, but it could not have hurt. <laughs> right. <laughs> it wouldn't have made it worse, is what you're saying. I mean, arguably, the first uh, space shuttles did have ejection seats. <laughs> For what? For ejecting. And to- OK, never mind. if you're if you're on a scent, possibly. Uh, but this was also like this was whenever the shuttle uh, there were initial uh, groups of shuttle launches that only had two astronauts. So they had a lot more room to put ejection seats on them. Yeah, because it's just yeet your payload and then leave. Yeah, you don't want to hit those if you're in orbit. <laughs> How do you file an insurance claim with the NSA? You don't. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> Fun fact, actually, a huge amount of rocket costs are insurance because they they like it costs a ridiculous amount of insurance. If you're if the thing that you are riding explodes two to five percent of the time. What am I going to say? Hey, NRO, if I rocket hit one of your black boxes, what's going to happen now? And they just (laughs) tell you stop. (laughs) Now, in the end, missions idea to have a cosmonaut spacewalk and inspect the station before docking was actually impossible. First off, one month was not nearly enough time to train crews on a spacewalk that complicated, especially because the spacecraft wouldn't actually be docked. This is happening like this spacewalk is happening while the station is floating next to the Soyuz, which means that there is a gap, which means that the cosmonaut would have to launch himself across open space to reach the station and do the same thing to get back. Oh, that's nightmare fuel. He's proposing some gravity level uh, shit, and there's a solid chance the cosmonaut could either miss or not grab on and just go careening off into space. They do it in the expanse all the time. I see no problem. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Fuck every inch of that. That is absolute nightmare fuel. The second more practical problem was that OKB's Vezda, the people who made Soviet spacesuits, uh, they just didn't have two of them handy. And there was no way they could possibly build one in a month. Although I would love to see what a one month rush job spacesuit looks like. <laughs> a trash bag <laughs> with a plexiglass <laughs> dome on top. Because we know that the OKB-1, their answer to a, a, a one year rush was to like take a bunch of different spacecraft and literally just duct tape and weld them together. So this would just be <laughs> like this spacesuit would just be made out of like five different flight suits, uh, just kind of like <laughs> sewn together haphazardly. We introduced new Ziploc technology. <laughs> that was actually an idea for spacesuits at one point. It's just like a large uh, yes. vape. I mean, at the end of the day, that is kind of what a spacesuit is. It's like an anthropomorphic uh, bag, kind of. And some people at some point said like, well, you know, you don't really need your legs to do anything if you're floating around. So why not just make them into like, why not make everything from the waist down just a large bag? So in the end, the only change from Soyuz 10 to Soyuz 11 was fixing the docking port on the actual spacecraft. Um, And while the spacesuit thing was a dumb idea, they will come to regret this later. 
In May, about two weeks before the planned launch, the Soyuz 11 crew and their backups were flown to Baikonur Cosmodrome. The Prime crew was commanded by the legendary cosmonaut Alexei Leonov, with Valery Kubasov as flight engineer and Pyotr Kolodin as research engineer. Their backups were Georgi uh, Dobrovolsky, Vladislav Volkov, and Viktor Patsayev. Uh, so you can see those two crews right there. Now, I want to take a second and lay out a different vibe from a lot of the other Soviet launches we have talked about. The audience knows that some of our favorite words on this show are, wouldn't it be nice to have something for the holidays? But in the lead-up to Soyuz 11, the mood of the Kremlin was considerably more cautious. They remembered how close the Soyuz 10 guys had come to dying, and they did not want a repeat. More importantly, they didn't want the blame. That's why they're rushing the job into a month's time span. See, here's the thing. Mission is the guy rushing. The Kremlin is just like, hey, do you want more time? We can give you more time. And Mission's just like, well, I mean, we got to get it done in a month. Damn it. If we don't do it in the next month, we'll, we'll have forgotten all of the lessons learned from the first one. Artificial deadlines are the best deadlines. Mission is sitting here staring at the open hand that is presented to him going, am I going to be shot if I take that? <laughs> <sighs> I, I, he, he has completely internalized. I'm convinced. Yeah, like any of these guys who have gone through, uh, like Glushko uh, Korolev, I think Mission is also a Gulag uh, alumnus. Um, <laughs> he grabs <graduated laughs> out of the Gulag. The gulag alumnus is a term. Spring Break 54 <laughs> Gulag. That's going to be a new enamel pin. I <laughs> uh, wish you were here instead of me. Yeah, so there is a lot of, like, institutionally, a lot of these people are just like, hey, maybe we don't rush this one. The Soviet Air Force even recommended that General Kamanin, the head of cosmonaut training, write a formal letter saying that the Air Force had reservations about the likelihood of mission failure. Basically, like, washing their hands of any responsibility. Kamanin just refused to write it, and thus, inadvertently, or, like, not inadvertently, he intentionally made the Soviet Air Force culpable for this mission. At the traditional pre-flight meeting at the Kremlin, Dmitry Ustinov, the head of the entire Soviet military industrial complex and the guy who like originally greenlit this whole program said, and I quote, launch Soyuz 11 only if you are certain that the preparations are satisfactory. We are not rushing you. <laughs> and that's kind of like heresy to our show, but <laughs> no, I, and the problem is I could see exactly how that would sit in his head. Because I can, that yeah, phrase if, means if, the exact opposite. I, I can also understand that if Dmitry Ustinov says like, hey, man, take as much time as you want. It reminds me a bit of like uh, when I'm giving students uh, a test, like one of their big, uh, you know, unit tests and a student will turn in their test really early. And I'll like just kind of take a look at it and be like, you have the whole period. Are you sure you want to be finished with this right now? I highly recommend you take the whole period. <laughs> Yeah. At, at, the, at the same time, I have done tests where I have been completely confident I got everything right within 15 minutes. <laughs> and then a TA said that and I immediately just like, uh, uh, I, just go, I go back, <laughs> I sit at my seat and I don't move for 45 minutes. I don't pick up my uh -huh. pencil. <laughs> nice of you to have uh -huh. teachers that, you know, do that. And so the take home test that is literally solved in a single sentence. The fluid power systems problem that is the entire system dumps to atmosphere. Water be wet. No work <laughs> happens. I had something I was going to say, but then I forgot. R regardless, like for, for these guys rushing this space program, like saying we are not rushing you is objectively good because rushing a space program is bad. At the same time, there is a political use for this. Like they're the hidden function of all of this is that the Air Force and the Kremlin, they were washing their hands of any responsibility if things went bad. They were effectively saying like, we tried to tell you, we, we warned you. Just to be clear here, this mission is planned for June 6th, 1971. And here is where we stand on June 3rd, 1971, just three days before launch. All the cosmonauts are at Baikonur Cosmodrome. The mission had been approved by the Kremlin and the docking system had been revamped to hopefully brackets work this time. What is this saved off? Please work dash number <laughs> two zero do, five. Yeah, do, docking port dot zero dot uh, final dot this time for sure dot done. Oh, so me every time. What me me in the process of making our video actually. I will brook no argument with that. You did a great job. Final edit. Final final edit for real too. 
me uh, asking Chris how he's doing with the videos, just like, I'm not rushing you. I am not rushing you whatsoever, but Christmas is coming up. So uh, that's where we're at on June 3rd. And then a routine medical x-ray found a big blotch on Valery Kubasov's right lung. Fearing tuberculosis, he was immediately booted off the mission. Oh, nice. Not nice. Sorry. Gone. <laughs> With Kubasov out, the immediate problem was who would replace him. Quoting from Salyut Triumph and Tragedy. This was unprecedented. In 1969, the original Soyuz 8 crew had been replaced as a result of poor scores in the training, but that was almost two months prior to the mission. In this case, the cosmonauts were already at Baikonur with just three days to the launch date. Who should fly? Representatives of the Air Force, the Ministry of General Machine Building, and the Ministry of Health had all signed a document which specified that in the event of a cosmonaut on a prime crew being medically disqualified prior to arriving uh, to Baikonur, he should be replaced by his backup. However, there should be no individual replacements once the crew were at the Cosmodrome. The plan was to replace the entire crew with its backup, which meant that Leonov's crew would have to be replaced by Dobrovolsky's crew. So... On paper, like, what this basically means is if you're already at the Cosmodrome, swap the entire fucking crew. Don't try and, like, mix and match. The plan would have been to replace um, Kubasov with Valery Volkov, or sorry, uh, Vladislav Volkov, who was, like, his role equivalent. They were both, I believe, uh, flight engineers. So, just three days before launch, there was a massive debate about who would actually fly on Soyuz 11. On paper, the solution was easy. Just replace the entire Prime crew with the backup crew. But the Air Force didn't want to. Uh, they proposed throwing out the rule and just substituting Kubasov for his backup Volkov. When Commandant suggested this to Mission, he agreed at first, only to change his mind a few hours later and come out swinging for Team Replace Em All. So we do have a cosmic schism. I feel like it makes sense to replace one of the crew, depending on what has happened to them. Mm -hmm. If they've like broken their ankle. Yeah, sure. Swap it out. But like, I feel like if one person has tuberculosis, if that's what you think it is, there, there is definitely a risk of that. Yeah. And like probably the other two have been exposed. And the team, the team familiarity training brackets, tongue kissing. Yeah. Like, yeah, maybe. Brackets, tongue kissing. <laughs> well, we need to get them to work together. What happens in the insertion stays at the insertion. <laughs> <laughs> but if that's true, then every single cosmonaut in the crew, like every cosmonaut ever has TB. <laughs> <laughs> Now, there are actual arguments to be made both ways. The reason for the rule in the first place was crew compatibility. Astronauts and cosmonauts need to work and live together through some of the most stressful work possible. They need to get along and be able to rely on each other in life-threatening situations. It's a big part of why crews are selected right at the start of training, so they can work together and develop bonds and like learn everyone's strengths and weaknesses and whatnot. Replacing a guy just before a launch introduces a stranger into this close-knit group, and especially when they're going to spend a month together on the station, this could cause problems. Therefore, it is better to not take the risk and just replace the whole crew wholesale. On the other hand, the prime crew for Soyuz 11 was substantially more qualified than their backups. Leonov and Kubasov were both spaceflight veterans. Meanwhile, the only member of the backup crew to ever fly was Volkov, and he wasn't even the mission's commander. Worse, because the backup team was originally meant to fly to the second Salyut station, they were actually a year behind on their training. Therefore, it's better to only replace Kubasov with Volkov and fly the mission with the most qualified cosmonauts available. It is worth mentioning that there was never any question about letting Kubasov fly the mission, although, long aside, he was in perfect health. The Soviet space program actually took medical examination very seriously, and they had their own failures to learn from. Just a year earlier, they'd failed to notice that cosmonaut Pavel Believ had a bleeding stomach ulcer, and he ultimately died from surgical complications. Uh, so they were not going to take that risk with Kubasov. So those are reasonable arguments that both sides made. And at a packed launch site meeting on June 4th, it was ultimately decided to replace both crews. But the arguments weren't actually what swayed people. It was politics. See, when Mission changed his mind, he said it was because he'd talked to the Kremlin and they supported replacing the entire crew. When Mission pitched the replacement at the meeting in Baikonur, he seemed to have the full backing of Brezhnev and the Politburo, so everyone fell in line. But he was lying. 
No one in the Politburo even knew about the crew change fiasco. The day before, they had officially confirmed the other crew as the crew to fly. <laughs> Mission didn't even talk to his own deputies. When he found out, Konstantin Bushiev, the OKB1 official who was like in charge of liaising with the Kremlin, raged. How dare you decide to do this without consulting us in Moscow? We have reported to the Politburo that Leonov's crew will fly. We confirmed how well they were prepared. And you, because of Kubasov, have replaced them all. Look at the situation in which you have placed Smirnov and Ustinov. Now they must urgently report again. So instead of reporting directly to the Kremlin, it's actually likely that the highest the decision ever went was Ustinov, i.e. Mission lied his way into replacing a mission's crew two days before launch, but he ultimately got what he wanted. Yeah, it's, you know, it's it's easier to ask for forgiveness than for permission. I've also got to respect a guy that knows exactly how much he can get away with without really, like, <laughs> facing any consequences. <laughs> but, like, I, I do kind of imagine a weird moment where you're in the Politburo, you have uh, approved a flight and then like two days later in the news, you see a completely like you approved Buzz Aldrin to be the first man on the moon. And then you watch TV and it's just like, wait, what? Why is he going out first? <laughs> now, understandably, the prime crew did not take the news well. Veteran space journalist Yaroslav Golovinov described the mood in the cosmonaut hotel like this. Leonov was so furious that he was simply growling. If he could, he would have strangled Kubasov. Poor Valeri could not understand what was going on. He was feeling perfectly well, and after all, it wasn't his fault. In the evening, Kolodin visited me, completely crushed. With a glass in his hand, he said, Yaroslav, you know I will never fly in space. And he was right. <laughs> a bit of a side tangent there. Kolodin actually never did fly in space his entire cosmonaut career. It's really weird. He gets in this repeated catch-22 cycle where he gets assigned to a crew and then they say, well, he doesn't have any experience. Let's replace him with someone with more experience. <laughs> so he never flies. So he never gets experience. So he never flies. So he never gets experience. And he stays a cosmonaut for like 20 years and then just retires. He's just like permanently a high school graduate going to college, <laughs> yeah. trying to find work and failing. This reminds me a bit of uh, like in middle school, all of my friends were skateboarders. And so like I wore skateboarder clothes and had like skate shoes and stuff and hung out with, you know, skateboarders at the skate park. Never skateboarded <laughs> ever. <laughs> couldn't do it. I had a skateboard. I couldn't do anything on it. So like it, it was literally just uh, sort of in the program, but never actually having to, to, to do anything. Except except this guy like Culloden, he would have killed to get to do the skateboarding. He desperately wants to. Yeah, very different motivations, him and yeah. I. Yeah. <laughs> Although it would be fun if there was just like a cosmonaut poser, just kind of in the back of every photo. <laughs> <laughs> that would be me. Like if I was if I was here, that that would absolutely be me because I I want to be in the group. I want to know all the stuff about what's going on, but I don't want to do anything dangerous. So you just want to like be seen by journalists at the launch site wearing a suit that you've kind of you would be wearing the Franken suit that Zvezda puts together in like two weeks. It just, it looks official. It looks orange. Why not? <laughs> so the same day the decision to swap the crews was made, everyone gathered for the ceremonial crew selection. To all the journalists present, nothing would have appeared wrong. This was the first time they were hearing about the crews, so they didn't know about all the changes that had been made mere hours before. Dobrovolsky, Patsyev, and Volkov were selected as the prime crew because they were always the prime crew, and that's just how things work. The only evidence was that Leonov, Kubasov, and Kolodin are sitting next to the prime crew and in the photos which you guys can see right here they just look completely crushed oh yeah no they're <laughs> <laughs> going to space not going to space <laughs> they took a ball peen hammer to the human spirit oh uh, yeah um so that is leonov on the left i believe kubasov on the right and then um Kolodin in the middle although i may be getting my kubasov and my Kolodin mixed up the only one who is recognizable is uh, Leonov because Leonov just looks like a thumb. He looks like he's 60. <laughs> I, I was so surprised by this. Leonov is like, in this photo, he's like 36. <laughs> his oh, neck man. and head are the same width. He just permanently looks like that his entire life. Oh yeah, he kind of got punched in the head enough. It fits. <laughs> that, was the, uh, that was the craziest thing. And I don't know if this is from the same day, but as I was doing some little reading of some of the Russian language stuff. And there's the article, I think it's one that I sent you on Instagram 
um, with uh, those, the interview with uh, Yuri Apanchenko, where he asks, when did you find out that your team is flying? Was this was this yesterday? And uh, I forget who it is. It's Dub Ravolsky who says, uh, no, this was today. That's <laughs> <laughs> great. Shit. Uh, so later, it actually turned out that Kubasov didn't have tuberculosis. He just had a pollen allergy. Also, the medical screenings had failed to notice that Viktor Potsayev had a chronic kidney inflammation. Um, so ironically, it kicks off a healthy guy and they send in a guy with a potentially serious illness. One month in space. Now. Soyuz 11 lifted off on June 6, 1971. The launch and orbital insertions went well. The Soyuz was able to rendezvous with Salyut 1 and approach it under control of the IGLA autopilot system, the same way the earlier Soyuz 10 had. Just like last time, the spacecraft lined up with the station and inserted the docking port. Just like last time, the spacecraft lined up with the station and inserted the docking port, but this time the crew turned off the autopilot and the docking sequence had been changed to be a lot more manual. They cracked the seal on the hatch about 27 hours into the mission, and Viktor Patsyev entered the world's first space station. This was a huge scientific and propaganda victory, only marred by the fact that the station was full of stale air and smelled like burnt plastic. Awesome. Welcome home. <laughs> See, shortly after launch, six of the station's eight ventilation fans had broken, and the remaining two had been run so much that they melted their housings, leaving the atmosphere in the station basically unbreathable. Like, this is not just a bad smell, this is like, they cannot breathe. <laughs> this was also a problem because as they opened the hatch, a load of Soviet officials were lining up on the radio to, like, congratulate the cosmonauts and give big televised propaganda speeches about this achievement. Uh, so Mission and Command and had to stall an increasingly impatient Brezhnev as Patsayev and Volkov donned gas masks and tried to figure out, like, why the station was on fire. <laughs> That's so like it would it would have just been, like, this televised image inside the station of, like, these guys fight, like, scrambling around this, like, smoke-filled room as Brezhnev talks about, like, the achievements of Soviet scientific progress and whatnot. It has big death of Stalin energy right there. It does, yeah. <laughs> All right, we go now to we go now to the station and it's just like flames rising above the in front of the screen. It is like looking like the death core of Creed. Oh, here. God. Yeah. Dude, that, being in zero G with one of those like tube elephant nose gas masks would be so much fun because <laughs> it's going to wind up all over the place. <laughs> what I wanted to say was that a fire in space sounds just as bad as a fire on a ship. <laughs> Maybe worse. Especially if you liken it to a fire on a submarine. Hold that thought. They were able to fix the fans, and it took just a bit of waiting in the Soyuz while the station cleaned the air. The next morning, they officially, on TV, entered Salyut 1, and instantly became famous. Quote, the Soviet press, television, and radio reported enthusiastically this latest success of the manned space program. The official line was that the Soviet Union had never participated in a race to beat the Americans to the moon. It was purely concentrating on space stations to conduct scientific research and benefit the national economy, at which it clearly led the way. Um, <laughs> so hell yeah, you can't lose a race you never officially joined. <laughs> no, we were never trying to. We just kind of did it by accident. <laughs> which at, at the same time, like... It would legitimately be more impressive if they told the truth here, because they were saying that the Salyut station was built in 11 years as opposed to one year, which it actually was. Like, you could tell people, like, look at how quick we built this thing. It, like, if it was meant to be something that they spent, like, yeah, we spent the last 11 years working on this. It's not that impressive. Now, because most of their stay in the station was routine, I'm just going to jump from day to day, tell you the important events, and sprinkle in some quotes from the Cosmonauts journals. To give a brief rundown, most of the cosmonauts' time was split between the flight program, so like their jobs, hygiene, physical exercise, four meals a day, individual rest periods, and eight hours of sleep. Every seventh day on the station was a weekend for the entire crew. Also remember that through all of this, uh, because the giant lens cap didn't deploy, most of the scientific equipment on the station was worthless. So, day four. The crew start using the exercise treadmill, but stop pretty quickly because it's so loud that it wakes people up, and the vibrations get transmitted through the hull of the station and make the solar panels, quote, flap. That's probably not good. Yeah. The space station was flying. For the rest of the mission, they will only use it for brief periods. From Potsayev's journal, 
The stars are almost invisible on the daylight portion of the orbit, even when observing through the porthole on the side facing away from the sun. Only Sirius and Vega can be seen. After sunset, the stars do not twinkle until their line of sight is close to the Earth's horizon. Day 5 The crew has their first medical checkup. They'll repeat these every five days. After the cosmonauts of Soyuz 9 came down physically wrecked after 18 days in orbit, exercise and health was a serious concern. On top of the treadmill, cosmonauts had two pieces of clothing that were supposed to help them maintain muscle tone and prevent calcium leaching out of their bones. The first I really like, this was a spring-loaded penguin suit that basically just made it really difficult to do anything. Uh, it kind of like forced you into the natural pose, so if you wanted to like move your arm a little bit you would have to fight the springs if you wanted to like the idea was these guys would basically just do their normal work but they do it in like these incredibly tough to use suits and it would you know they'd get a workout the second was the vater which means wind i'm probably mispronouncing that vacuum pants which i love those i love that term i love vacuum pants mm -hmm. <laughs> So basically, because blood doesn't flow good to the lower body in space, and then once you get on Earth, the your circulatory system has trouble readapting, these pants, you would put them on, you would seal them around your waist, and then they would like create a vacuum around your junk because the negative pressure zone would pull blood down there in order to like force it to actually go where it's supposed to go. Now... Patsyev's journal notes that shaving is difficult. He has a razor that has been specifically designed to, like, collect the stray hairs in Zero-G, uh, but it doesn't work, and so they go everywhere. <laughs> oh, no. Day 7. Volkov's journal. 12th of June. I woke up. I drank water from the new tank. We finished the first one. After Victor had prepared the vacuum cleaner, I swam through the compartment cleaning it. Jora is strapped in his seat and diligently writing something in his flight journal. Victor has prepared his sleeping space in the hatch between the descent module and the orbital mo module. Soon we will be in communication with the Earth, but now, according to schedule, I must exercise. Uh, also, throughout their time in space, the cosmonauts would regularly appear on Cosmocasts, which are a sort of like reality TV in space. Three guys in a pod. Viewers at home would get guided tours of the station from Volkov or Dobrovolsky. Uh, Patsyev was normally not seen because he was the guy holding the camera. And they would learn all about, like, life in space. Quote, While the fixed TV camera monitored their activities, the cosmonauts took their exercises, engaged in numerous scientific experiments, and even cast the first votes from space, affirming their support for the Communist Party's policies, of course. <laughs> Excerpts from the broadcast from Salyut were repeatedly shown on Moscow TV, and owing to his rugged good looks, Volkov soon became an idol for many teenage girls. <laughs> um, I do love the, uh, I love voting from space. That fucking rules. I, I think I'd get pretty cynical pretty quick. I'd be like, I do not want to do another one of these. Mm -hmm. I'm not, I'm not certain, but over time with the Cosmocast, you see like Dobrovolsky starting to be the main guy more and more. So you get the feeling that Volkov was just like, oh, <laughs> like, they keep all these girls keep sending me creepy letters. I'm I don't want to do this anymore. He's like, my girlfriend's going to be pissed. Yeah. <laughs> Imagine voting, voting against uh, support for the Communist Party. What are you going to do? Like, what are you going to do? I'm in. Space. What are you going to do? Crash, <laughs> crash my spaceship. Well, I mean, we have talked about how some Soviet spacecraft had scuttling charges included. I don't think the Soyuz ever did. <laughs> just, just like the instant he cast the vote wrong, uh, the screen just like immediately goes to static. And it's just like the next day, it's just uh, there was an unexpected uh, explosion on Salyut. There's an R7 with your name on it. It's on its way. <laughs> Little did you know there was a hidden, you know, fourth member of the Politburo that just had a hand grenade. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we've specially trained an orbital attack dog. It weighs six pounds. Throw Leica at whoever is uh, voting against the common turn. All right. Now, th this one I actually really do. This part I love. This is the most like I, I love. I'll send a link to it. But like reading through this stuff, it's so much of just like guys being really relatable. Day 11, Dobrovolsky's journal. Stupid weightlessness. Another pencil's gone missing, yells Vadim. Weightlessness is an interesting state. I am writing with Victor's pencil. I lost mine a long time ago. Almost all our pencils have gone. The space station eating pencils like the dryer eats socks. And this is all. This is also part of the reason why uh, the space pen became a thing. Because was... having graphite floating everywhere is not good. Do you think Victor was like, I'm going to give you this pencil, but if you lose my damn pencil, <laughs> I swear to God. 
But like, I can imagine, I can imagine the frustration though. It's like, where are they going? Yeah, <laughs> just like, not the, there's not that much space. I guarantee you, they got they got Victor's pencil down to like the la- like whenever it's like one centimeter long, and like the eraser is just completely <laughs> gone. <laughs> Victor's probably been collecting them. He's just fucking with everybody. He's like, I don't, I don't know where they are. It's weird. <laughs> oh yeah, dude, that that would be the best space economy. Forget like, <laughs> forget Metro and bottle caps and whatnot. Just pencils. No, <laughs> this is guaranteed the first ever extraterrestrial human ass beating that has ever taken place. And it's <laughs> over pens and pencils. <laughs> Okay, at some point we will talk about the later Salute line brawl, um, <laughs> which is just like, because the thing with the Salute and the same thing, uh, like Skylab is less this, like both of these are big, long cans, okay? But Skylab, they have a bunch of like floors in it. They kind of section it off with some grating. With Salute, what you can do is you can fully be at one end of the can and just like diving tackle across the entire thing. <laughs> and this is where it gets less fun. Later in the morning, controllers on the ground heard Volkov shout over the radio, Aboard the station is the curtain! That, that probably makes no sense. But because their transmissions could be picked up by Western observers, problems were always reported in code. Unfortunately, the controller on the ground forgot what the curtain was code for and oh. asked Volkov oh, no. to explain. <laughs> and then, over a live transmission to the entire world, he shouted, There is a fire on board! We're now entering the Soyuz! Oh! So they are 10 days. Yeah, they they are 10 days into the world's first space station. It's already on fire. It's just funny imagining like we we talk a bit on our show about, you know, U-boats and such and, you know, intercepting and code breaking and things like that. Just like, you know, intercepting, you know, a a German code in the middle of World War Two and then intercepting the next message. That's just a reply saying, what was that again? (laughs) Can, Can you explain that? My enigma broke. Where's my I I don't have my book on me. Can you explain that again? I assume the controller knew that the curtain was a code and that he had just forgotten, like, okay, is that fire? Is that flooding? Is that an earthquake? But I choose to imagine that the controller was just like, all right, the curtains are missing. Like, oh, holy shit, we need to get a a crew up there right away, sir. They say the curtains are gone. They need lace, a stat. (laughs) I can imagine being like first day at a new job and someone says that and you go report to your superior. He's he's saying something about the curtains are missing. And then your your supervisor just like goes like completely white. (laughs) So, yeah, there is a fire on the station. Uh, Whenever he said we're now entering the Soyuz, what he meant was they were evacuating out of the Salyut and away from the fire. As the crew evacuated to the Soyuz, they argued with mission control over the radio. The crew wanted to completely undock from the station and mission control wanted them to try and fight the fire. In the end, a compromise was reached. The cosmonauts would turn off all of the scientific equipment before evacuating, and controllers on the ground would use the TV cameras to figure out where the smoke was coming from. They identified it as a control panel for the broken scientific equipment, and luckily, the world's first orbital fire was put out without much harm, aside from giving all of the cosmonauts smoke inhalation and headaches for days. I like the idea of everyone on the ground, though, being like, no, no, you guys go fight that. Put that fire out. Like that's important. <laughs> yeah, like they're they're looking they're looking through the hatch, just seeing this like roaring inferno. And mission control is just like, yeah, you know, you got some water or something, right? <laughs> Day fourteen. Viktor Patsyev turns thirty eight and becomes the first person to celebrate their birthday in space. His gifts are an onion from Volkov and a lemon from Dobrovolsky, both of which have been secretly smuggled on board for the occasion. God bless. Yeah. Where has he been hiding an onion? Just I, his pants, away, I don't know. <laughs> they weren't wearing spacesuits either. <laughs> well, uh, okay. I mean, let's think about it. Both an onion and, an, uh, and a lemon, you have to peel those. So regardless of how dirty the outside gets, it's still good. It's All true. the little onion shards floating around in your, in your capsule. It'll be oh, great. God. Mm-hmm. I don't think they'll be... Like you're just crying for the entire rest of your space mission. <laughs> As your as your eyes heal from the onion, a little bit of lemon oh, juice just goes right back in. <laughs> ah. Yeah, like someone on the ground is just like looking at the atmosphere and it's just like, all right, uh, yesterday it was 100% oxygen. Now it's 98% oxygen, 1% onion, and there's a bit of lemon juice in there. <laughs> does, does one of you have an onion up there? No. God damn it's it. Just like crunching in the background. The like flakes of the onion skin. <laughs> Uh, 
And like, normally I would not be psyched to eat an onion and a lemon back to back, but considering like this is day 14, they ha- this is two weeks in. This is the first fresh food that any of them have seen in a while. And before this, the last fresh food they saw was whatever was shipped to Baikonur. So, oh, they're experiencing flavor.jpg right now. <laughs> so they're, they're tired of their space man ice cream is what I'm hearing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> That's all they eat, right? You just you just like get out of your uh, your trailer in Baikonur. You see like a scorpion go by and you just pounce on it like a mongoose. <laughs> uh, yeah. Rip off its tail so it can't sting you and then just eat it whole. <laughs> My favorite space food thing was still that like prior to uh, some of the Mercury launches that like um, the the chimps got better food than the astronauts. And we're just like <laughs> pounding back uh, creatine and jello all day. I'm thinking about I'm thinking about have, have you guys seen the movie Rocket Man? Which Can one? we talk about this in the first one? I, I don't think the one so. With, uh, the one with Harlan Williams, and they're going to Mars. William Sadler's in it also. Um, and they have to go with a, with a chimpanzee. Uh, it's from like the late 90s, probably 98, 97. There's a scene where the, the, the monkey is taking is trying to take the human food. And I'm just reminded of the phrase where he's like, no, 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 you you eat the monkey fruitcake. And he like gives him like a little tube of <laughs> uh, tube of food. And then at one point he ends up accidentally uh, feeding them hemorrhoid cream instead of like the tube. Oh, okay. food that you're supposed to be eating. <laughs> so it's, it's, oh. a, it's a fun. It, it movie. has great There's, bonus th- potential probably for you guys. <laughs> hell, uh, hell yeah. I'll take a look at it. <laughs> it sounds like it's starting into an extra episode really quickly. <laughs> <laughs> There's one scene in particular that I feel like doesn't age very well, Taylor. It's the scene where they sing he's got the whole world yeah, in his hands. There's there's a it doesn't age well particularly. <laughs> um it's not t- nothing too terrible, but uh probably wouldn't do it in a movie today. Uh but yeah, definitely worth watching. It's a funny movie. It's it's it, we we watched it tons of times. <laughs> Uh, late 90s, early 2000s movies about going to Mars just kind of blend together in my head. Absolutely. <laughs> as shitty as it is, it is a very bad movie. I like the one with the killer robot where like the military robot goes insane and starts killing everyone. That's fun. What movie? Uh, I think it's called like Red Planet. No, uh, but regardless. So uh, we're still on day 14. Volkov's Diary, 2130. At the start of my duty, I will be the first to see the globe instrument indicate 1,000 orbits. This historic event will occur during my time on duty. Simply unbelievable. The rest of the mission proceeded pretty normally. The cosmonauts went through their routines, they exercised, they observed rocket launches from Baikonur, and they answered questions on TV from adoring fans. Um, On the 23rd day, they started the process of mothballing the station, basically getting it set up for the next crew and loading any hardware that needed to come back to Earth into the Soyuz's descent module. On the 24th day, the Soyuz was ready, and the crew made their way out of Salyut 1, sealing every hatch behind them. The last of these was the hatch between the Soyuz's descent stage and the onion-shaped orbital stage. Like we've talked about, the Soyuz ditches the orbital module before re-entry, so it needs to have an airtight seal between the two. As the last man out, Dobrovolsky tried to seal the hatch and ran into a problem. The hatch wouldn't seal. He could close it, but the light that signaled a good seal wouldn't turn on. He tried it again, nothing changed. Mission Control's solution is going to make some people mad. See, the way that the Soyuz hatch indicates an airtight seal is the exact same way that a fridge knows when the door is open. Around the inside of the hatch are a series of buttons, and when the hatch closes, it presses against all those buttons. Um, And whenever they're all pressed, the hatch open light turns off. Simple. There is actually no like, hey, is this airtight? Is this anything? It's just like, has the button been pressed? Now, since the hatch wasn't closing properly, Mission Control just told the cosmonauts to put a bit of tape over the offending button so it would properly register as sealed. Yes. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, I'm just going to place a a small marker here. This is where the misery (laughs) starts. Yeah, so if you go down a little bit, slide 56, you can see the hatch that is on the uh, the inside of the uh, descent module. So yeah, like just around one of those little six places, they just, yeah, put a little bit of tape there. It's good. Um, I know earlier we said they treat everything like it's a tractor. This, this may be one of those times where you shouldn't do that. Yeah, I do like that kind of approach, though, to engineering where people are like, well, it's not working. Should we actually fix the problem or should we cheat so it thinks we fixed the problem? Surely it's the sensor that is wrong. And their solution with a fucking space, like a spacecraft is, eh, you know, just trick the computer. 
Yeah, I mean, I know several uh, flight disaster stories that I've you know listened to or, or seen on stuff where a key alert is missed because like, well, this this alert always goes off and we just unplug it. <laughs> and that's normally how we deal with it. And it's like until there's a real problem with it. This is not actually going to be the pro- like as stupid as it sounds. This is not the problem. <laughs> Because I think what happened with this seal was just that, like, it wasn't that the hatch wasn't actually closing. It's just that the button, like, the button had been manufactured wrong and it was like a millimeter short or something. The hatch was in the proper position and it being in the proper position for some reason didn't press the button. So the hatch did actually close. Like, it was just short of its actuation point. Yeah, exactly. Uh... But still, that is not... (laughs) They didn't know that mission control did not like mission control did not have the time to sort that out. They just said, like, break out the duct tape. (laughs) Now, with the hatch sorted out, the crew were free to undock from the salute and float free. They did a last visual inspection of the station for damage, then started the reentry procedure. They had three orbits to go or about five hours and controllers on the ground. Remember them being eager and maybe a little impatient to get back to Earth. As the orbits ticked down and the crew was getting ready for the re-entry burn that had slowed them down out of orbit, they drifted out of communication range with Soviet tracking ships. Now, there's a bit of contention with the exact last transmission from Soyuz 11, uh, but Dobrovolsky relayed that he was starting the descent procedure while Volkov shouted in the background that the recovery crew better have some cognac ready. (laughs) I'm going to have a drink on landing. You better be set for me, buddy. Yeah. This is where things take a bad Bondarenko turn. If that is something you don't want to hear, uh, this is the time to stop listening. Thank you. So the Soviets didn't have global communications coverage at this point in 1971. They had tracking ships dotted along Soyuz 11's orbital path, but even then, there were periods where the spacecraft was out of range. This was normal, and they planned for it. But as the minutes dragged by and the spacecraft drifted into areas that should have been covered, mission control still got no answer. Due to weight savings, the Soyuz descent module didn't have the equipment to transmit its own telemetry, so it couldn't relay automatically like, hey, I'm in this stage, the computer is doing this. Like, no mission control information was provided. It was just, we're completely blind of falling through the atmosphere. Yeah. So for mission control to know the status of the spacecraft, Dobrovolsky would have to physically tell them over the radio. And because he wasn't talking, they didn't know what Soyuz 11 was doing. They didn't know if the braking burn had been completed or if the modules had been ditched. So again, like because of how the Soyuz is built before it goes for reentry, it turns 90 degrees. So it, it turns 90 degrees and then it separates the orbital and the service modules, which are the top and bottom, leaving just the kind of bell-shaped re-entry module. So yeah, the system relied entirely on the cosmonauts talking to them and the crew of Soyuz 11 were silent. Part of this isn't actually down to the crew. Because of an order mix-up, the tracking ship Bejitsa that was supposed to monitor the descent phase sailed out of position and didn't make it back in time. So they were supposed to be like right under the flight path and able to pick up transmission from Soyuz 11. Um, and they just kind of went like 100 miles in the wrong direction. If the crew were talking, it's likely the ship wouldn't have been able to hear them. So basically we have this situation where no one, like not only is all of this communications apparatus falling apart, even whenever Soyuz 11 is in communications range, uh, like they don't get anything from it. Knowing what we know about the Soviet Navy, that that sounds pretty accurate as that they're just kind of cruising around, not quite sure what they're doing. So with this ship... The issue is uh, that they have been out there for four months because every time one of these um, like launches gets delayed or pushed around or whatnot, that ship is still like sitting out in the middle of the of the Atlantic. Um, So these guys are like they are almost out of food. Their equipment is breaking (laughs) down and they get an order that says, hey, uh, go to Cuba and get some food. And so they immediately start following that only to get an order a couple of hours later. Just like, where are you? We don't know where the spacecraft is. You're supposed to be watching it. (laughs) Quote, at 1.45 a.m., almost seven minutes after finishing the braking maneuver, Soyuz 11 crossed the coast of Portugal. Shortly thereafter, the automated system rotated it through 90 degrees in order to position the orbital module on top and the propulsion module facing down. At 1.47 a.m., while passing over France, 12 explosive charges jettisoned the orbital module and six more jettisoned the propulsion module. 
The spacecraft was well within range of Soviet tracking stations in Crimea by now. Kamanin ordered Dobrovolsky to respond, but still got nothing. Ten minutes later, Soviet radars picked up the descent module plowing through the atmosphere over the Black Sea. The craft was intact and following the proper re-entry path. Mechanically, at least, everything seemed to be working fine, so mission control assumed that the silence was just a radio failure. Thirty minutes later, recovery crews watched the module deploy its parachute and drift to the ground, exactly as planned. The mood in mission control was triumphant. Not only had Soyuz 11 landed safely, but it was also the end to a historic mission. The first crew to ever actually live in space, not crammed into a tiny, like, a vessel smaller than a car. They'd smashed the previous record for time in space by almost a week. Everybody waited for reports from the recovery team and to hear from the cosmonauts now that they were safely back on Earth, but they didn't hear anything. It'd be over an hour before a recovery team member got on the radio and reported code 111. See, the Soviets used numbers to track cosmonaut health. Five meant perfect health, four was good health, three was had some injuries, two was severe injuries, and one was dead. Code 111 meant all three cosmonauts had died. One of the recovery team described the scene like this. Outwardly, there was no damage whatsoever. They knocked on the side, and there was no response from within. On opening the hatch, they found all three men in their couches, motionless, with dark blue patches on their faces, and trails of blood from their noses and ears. They removed them from the descent module. Dobrovolsky was still warm. The doctors gave artificial respiration. Based on the reports, the cause of death was suffocation. So that hour, uh, where the recovery crew didn't report, was spent trying to revive the cosmonauts. I do not recommend it, but you can find footage online of these crews doing CPR on the cosmonauts. And as someone who's done CPR for a couple of minutes, maintaining it for as long as they do in these videos is, like, incredibly tiring. These guys gave it, like, everything they possibly could. In the end, it was determined that the cosmonauts had already been dead for over 30 minutes when they were pulled from the Soyuz. So, what actually happened? A later investigation found that the braking maneuver worked perfectly. The spacecraft automatically shut off its engines and spun 90 degrees to separate the orbital and service modules from the descent module. Twelve explosive bolts went off at once, cleanly severing the links between the orbital and descent modules. As soon as that happened, the crew heard the sound of a leak. We don't have recordings, but we do have heart and breathing rates. We know that they reacted immediately. Thinking that the problem was the hatch with the faulty sensor, Dobrovolsky unbuckled from his seat and went to investigate. But the hatch was properly sealed. Meanwhile, Volkov and Patsayev turned off the radio equipment to better hear the sound of the leak and try and figure out where it was. So, the Soyuz had a pair of pressure equalization vents placed just behind the cosmonauts' seats. The idea here is that the descent module is so small and so packed with equipment that it didn't actually have its own life support. It was just a metal balloon. Whatever was in there, it was only meant to be used for the few minutes that it took from re-entry to landing. But if a crew stayed in there long enough, they'd suffocate. Those vents were designed to open automatically once the pod was at about 5 kilometers of altitude. This had equalized the pod's pressure with the atmosphere, and it, uh, but it would also let the cosmonauts breathe if they needed to wait a long time for recovery. This was basically cracking a window for fresh air. Somehow, deploying the orbital stage had knocked one of these valves open at 150 kilometers altitude, exposing the entire capsule to vacuum. Once they knew the leak was in the vents, Patsayev went to close valve number two, because this was the one that was marked as open. But sometime in building the spacecraft, the valves had been mislabeled, and it was actually valve number one that was leaking. And he lost critical seconds before he realized that. Quote, It is difficult to know who did so, but either Patsayev or Dobrovolsky began to close the hand-operated shutter of valve number one. However, in normal circumstances, it required at least 35 seconds to close the valve by hand, and by the time they passed out, it was only partially cycled. So... <sighs> In oxygen deprivation situations like this, a human has maybe 13 seconds of good, useful action. That is how much oxygen reserve, like, that's the time it takes for oxygen to get from your lungs to your head, to your brain. Like, zero to apoxia is that time. Uh, yes, basically. Because once your lungs stop getting good oxygen, there is still 13 seconds of good blood moving around your system to your brain. 
past that point, your lungs start to feed oxygen poor blood to your brain. You become less conscious and less able to save yourself, which only gets worse and worse as the oxygen level drops. And in this case, it dropped to zero. I'm not going to describe medically what exposure to vacuum did to these men, but suffice to say that their deaths were not quick or painless. The cosmonauts were conscious for almost an entire minute, most of that time unable to act and paralyzed by oxygen starvation. They were dead within two minutes, and the capsule was exposed to vacuum for another 11.5 minutes. So, yeah. Yeah, that sounds a lot different than what I think of when I think of, like, a airline disaster. Like, I think it's Helios Air, where everyone passes out, but it's more like, in that case, you kind of just go to sleep. It's a lot different than this. In this case, you get the full spectrum. You are getting yeah. the full fucking... Well, it's, it's, it's a situation of not only... Do you not have any oxygen? You have no air at all, right? Like it's in in the case of like like and again, I, I don't remember whether it was Helios, but yeah, I, I do recall there's at least one aviation disaster that I know of where um, depressurization had occurred and they passed out because they didn't get enough oxygen um, yeah. because they're at high altitude. <laughs> so. There was another big one like that. It was a it was a golf, right? I think it was something pain and oh, pain Stewart. Yeah, yeah that same thing with him. Yeah, flying over what the Dakotas for like two hours with nothing but corpses, and it was just on autopilot. Jesus, and yeah, like they have they have thirteen seconds of actual get stuff done, and both like Dobrovolsky completely understandably wastes some of his because he goes to fix the hatch that has a big problem that they had two hours ago and Patsayev, he goes to the valve and he looks at the valve trying to figure out which one is open. And one of them has its little like occupied switch set to open. He goes to that one, but the technician just fucked it up. So it's actually the other one. So even if they did have time, like, and again, these, each of these valves takes 30 seconds to operate if done perfectly even then, yeah, like so many problems kind of coincide to make this impossible to survive. The legacy of Soyuz 11. So Viktor Patsyev, Vladislav Volkov, and Georgi Dobrovolsky were buried in a state funeral in Moscow. As the capsule depressurized at around 150 kilometers altitude, well above the von Karman line that defines space, they remain the only humans to ever die in space. The pallbearers for Dombrovolsky's urn were cosmonauts Leonov, Shatilov, Nikolaev, and American cosmonaut Tom Stafford. Stafford was basically there as uh, Nixon's representative, but also invited to be a pallbearer because space travelers. He's, he's one of the community. He is one of the people yes. this can happen to. This is also where Stafford meets Alexei Leonov. Uh, the two become friends partially because of this and they would later be the two captains of the Apollo-Soyuz mission. One month after the funeral, the crew of Apollo 15 laid a small metal plaque and statue on the surface of the moon. This statue is called the Fallen Astronaut, and on the plaque are inscribed the names of the then 14 known astronauts and cosmonauts who had died in missions, training, or in accidents. Late editions, Volkov, Patsyev, and Dobrovolsky are still on it. And this is just like, uh, this is just one thing I, I don't like. But it's like the fact this was not approved by NASA. This is just like the Apollo 15 astronauts. They get an artist to make this thing for them and they just sneak it to the moon and it's still up there. The downside is that on the Soviet side, Nelly Yubov and Bondarenko are not on it because they had been disappeared. And on the American side, the first uh, black astronaut candidate did not make it on either. He had been killed in a training accident. Yeah, so not not perfect. While the deaths of the Soyuz 11 crew couldn't be covered up and the funeral was public, the Kremlin still hid the details of their death. On July 10th, 1971, the State Commission released the only official statement regarding Soyuz 11, ever. It was 200 words long. Quote, On the ship's descent trajectory 30 minutes prior to landing, a rapid drop of pressure occurred in the descent module leading to the sudden deaths of the cosmonauts. This is verified by the medical and pathological anatomical examinations. The drop in pressure was the result of a loss of the ship's hermetic seal. An inspection of the descent module showed the, there were no failures in its structure. A technical analysis has determined several possible causes for the loss of the seal. The studies of these continue. So 
It's just, it's very quick. It's just, hey, a bad thing happened. People died, stuff happened, whatever. It lost its seal, but also there were no failures. Something failed, therefore nothing failed. Exactly. A good deal of the data has actually never been released, even till today. We still don't have the final report of the investigation into the disaster. We don't have the descent module's black box recorder, and we don't have the full autopsy records. The only reason we have any details about Soyuz 11 is because of outside investigators. In 1972, the Washington Post published that the crew had died because of a faulty valve. They were unable to close in time. So they, they basically lay out all of... Through talking to different people and investigating, the Washington Post is able to, like, figure out the most complete story at the time. Uh, later, this would be, like, as the, Soyuz, uh, as the Soviet Union fell and different people talked, this would be kind of fleshed out and confirmed. In 1975, when NASA and the Soviets were planning the Apollo-Soyuz mission, because NASA was like, hey, if we're going to dock with a Soyuz, we need you to tell us what happened. <laughs> They forced the Soviets to fess up and confirm the post story. The Soyuz 11 disaster grounded manned Soviet spaceflight for over two years. Salyut 1 never got another crew and was deorbited after 175 days in space. The biggest change was the need for IVA suits, and an IVA suit is a intravehicular activity suit. This is a space suit that you wear while you are inside of a spacecraft in case it depressurizes. If Soyuz 11 had pressure suits, the crew would have survived no problem. Everything except the vent worked perfectly. Two years were spent redesigning the Soyuz so it could accommodate three cosmonauts in new Sokol spacesuits. This same model has been used ever since on every Soyuz launch, and every Chinese manned launch as well. Now, I wish I could say that the lesson that IVA suits are important was learned by everyone, but it wasn't. Despite the fact that uh, Soyuz 11 happened earlier, like... The Soviets learned their lesson from a Soviet mistake. NASA did not learn from the Soviet mistake. They had to learn from their own mistake. Aside from the earliest test launches, shuttle astronauts flew without pressure suits all the way until the Challenger disaster in 1986. Challenger was the 25th shuttle flight. Since then, though, everyone going to orbit seems to have gotten the idea. Aside from uh, some of the space tourism stuff that doesn't go to orbit, everybody is wearing these suits now in case of depressurization. Now... <sighs> And this is, uh, the last two things are going to make people mad instead of sad. So I feel, figure that's a, at least a nice way to redirect some of the misery. One question continues to dog a lot of space historians. Could the crew have survived? In the years after Soyuz 11, Mission, along with some of the engineers at OKB-1, would continue to insist that the crew could have easily survived if someone had just stuck his finger in the valve. I want to throttle him. <laughs> I want him I want him to know what it feels like when he's when he's suffering from oxygen deprivation from me having crushed his fucking windpipe. <laughs> yeah, so unfortunately according to Mission, the crew were just too stupid to figure that out. Okay, back up. Uh so no we have two factors here. Number one, we've acknowledged that our boy Chris here is capable of radical action and two, <laughs> no shit. Which is, you again, like, if you, if, you, if you stick your finger in there, your finger is now exposed to vacuum. They were in vacuum <laughs> for another 12 minutes. And that's if it makes a perfect seal. And epoxy is not just an idiot switch. It is every single, you know, human factor going out the window. It's simply yeah. lights are orange now. And that might be the most that you ever hear. And then that's it. And another thing is that even if you even if you could plug the hole, the issue one of the issues is that the Soyuz capsule does not have its own air tanks. It cannot replenish anything. It is a metal balloon. So any air that you have lost, you have lost. Even if you plug the hole after like 10 seconds, you're still going to die because because this thing cannot replenish its own atmosphere. The, and this is not something that like this does happen in the moment. So, like, there are people in the 70s who are like, no, mission, that's fucking horrible. Why are you saying that? He does not change his tune. Right up until he dies, mission continues to say this. Um, and he even later on, he uses, um, I, I'm blanking which shuttle. I'll, we'll talk about it at some point. But one guy does get his finger exposed to vacuum. And but it's like the tiniest little pin prick. It's something inside of his glove comes detached and like makes the tiniest little hole. And he didn't even notice 
until he got back on the station because his blood had coagulated and filled the gap. That would not have happened if someone had shoved their entire finger into this. This thing is two centimeters across, you know? There's like, you would have to get your finger pretty far in there to actually seal it. You're getting your entire lifeblood sucked out. <laughs> so you'll be happy to know that a huge number of doctors and cosmonauts openly condemned Mission for basically the rest of his life for his efforts to blame the crew. Good. In a test to prove him wrong, cosmonaut Alexei Leonov actually like he practiced. He sat down in the Soyuz simulator and he timed how quickly he could like get out of his seat, lean over the seat because it's behind him and close this valve. His best time was 52 seconds, which is four times longer than the Soyuz 11 crew had. I think that with Leonov is really interesting because like that's his demonstration to show that this is impossible with that time. And that's with him knowing exactly what he has to do before it happens. Mm -hmm. He practices multiple times. Like he has times that are minute plus, like that is the best he could possibly do. Yeah. Like, and not, not him having to figure out in a matter of seconds, what is going on? What do I have to do? Especially whenever they have two other candidates first, because it is a reasonable assumption to say like, hey, there's a leak. Maybe it's that hatch that we duct taped closed. Mm -hmm. I'm going to go investigate. And then Patsayev leans over his seat and he sees a vent that says open and he goes to that one and it's the other one. So they have even less time. Honestly, the worst part about it is you see it so far across the industry because you have something similar with the early approaches to the, uh, oh God, what was it? Solenberger case crash landing on the Hudson. Why did you just restart the engines? They were busted. Huh. What if you just turned to this airport? That's assuming that you immediately knew that I had no propulsive power. Yeah, the same thing yeah. here. You have no reserve. It is you are on the final line. <laughs> Even if they did have a way and enough time to do that, like people, whenever they look at a disaster, they like to look at it A to Z. They like to look at it like, well, the thing happened. Why didn't you do the thing to fix it? But in the moment, it's actually like going through the options. Diagnosing it. They, they had to diagnose it. They didn't know what the problem was. And by the time they did, they already didn't have enough time. Like on the plus side, it is working. I'm making myself more angry than sad. <laughs> oh, don't worry. You have me pissed off. Pardon my language, but... It has me kind of wondering if Mission was actually just like, you know what? Everyone's really sad right now. I'm going to shift everyone's mood. I'm going to be a heat sink. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do the most infuriating thing a man could possibly do. Mission continues to be the easily most hateable guy in the entire Soviet space program. And in a way, by, by taking that upon himself, really highlights Mission as a Christ figure yeah. in the story, I think. <laughs> yeah, just just like if if all of Christianity was made around, like, hating Christ, like, fuck that guy. He deserves to be up there. <laughs> now, I will say, take my opinion with a grain of salt, because we just recorded a bonus episode with uh, 10,000 losses about the movie The Garbage Picking Field Goal Kicking Philadelphia Phenomenon. Oh, yeah. And I also uh, argued that he is a, a Christ-like figure. So. <laughs> so, like, the thing that I love about, not love, the thing that I appreciate about Mission that you do kind of have a point about there, Chris, is that, like, there's no lack of people to hate in the Soviet space program. Kamanin, uh, fucking Nelyubov, Glushko, Korolev to some degree. All of these guys have the, and then, like, Mission just comes in and it's just like, yep, they fucking deserved it, should have shoved their thumb in there, that's what I would have done. All he does is make himself hateable. That's it. Yeah. Now, to cap things off, a lot of history, and especially the history the Soviets liked to tell, compared Soyuz 11 to Soyuz 1. So, like, the way they wanted to say this was that both of these were missions that went perfectly fine until a freak accident that no one could have predicted or prevented killed the crew. Stuff happens. Cosmonauts have dangerous jobs. But in both cases, that is not true. Ignoring the fact that the entire Salyut program was a dangerous rush job with crews given minimal training, ignore the fact that Dobrovolsky, Volkov, and Patsayev had a year left in their training before they were supposed to fly. Like, the crew didn't even have oxygen masks, let alone pressure suits, and the descent pod didn't have its own, like, there are so many problems that could have been noticed. Uh, and like prevented to stop this. E like even if you just had a spare oxygen tank inside of the pod, that could have given them enough time. Like you can just crank open the oxygen and you can handle a leak that way. Literally just 
blast out. Just blast air faster than the leak can can shed it. But other, even just things with the design, like the valves were placed too close to the explosive bolts and they were awkwardly placed behind the cosmonaut seats. Like there is merit to both sides uh, whenever it comes to automation versus human. The Soviets, the Soviet space program historically wound up very hard on the, um, the automation side while the Americans wound up on the human part of this. One of, one of the benefits of making things very manual is the ability to handle disasters and American crews historically like are much better able like Apollo 13. I do not think would have worked if it was a Soyuz because they are not like the Soyuz is not designed to be used by the people in it. It is meant to be automated and it just ferries them around. It's interesting that they take the same approach in like their tank design and that they use auto loaders and stuff. Whereas we've always gone with manual loading and it's sort of the same thing that it's one less thing that breaks and the crew just knows what to do. Yeah. Which is, which is like automated stuff works. Like I, I guess the, the kind of trade off there, especially with the tanks is that like automated stuff works better when everything works. But as soon as something doesn't work, you're going to wish you had, you were actually able to like repair it on hand. You saw shades of this during the, I want to say TU-22, the plane, where the pilots had a absolutely monstrous instrument display. And sometimes they have to resort to, okay, I crafted a hook out of, you know, this hanging cord and I have tied it here so that I can, you know, pull it back just enough. Uh, the, so- the Soyuz actually uses that today because whenever Soyuz cosmonauts are sitting in their seats... The control panel is too far away for a lot of them to reach with their hands. So they have to have a little like push button. They have a little rod with like a thumb at the end and they use that to push buttons. I'm sorry for certain, but there it fucking is. It's been there for so goddamn long. Yeah. This is not laughing. This is pain. So, so basically my point here is that like Soyuz one, Soyuz 11 was not just like a random freak accident. There were problems along the way. There were rushes. Things were ignored, like especially the fact that um, it was not just like I should clarify the vents being mislabeled was not just like a a, a technician put the wrong, wrong one on the wrong one. It was an institutional documentation failure. What happened was in the design chain, they said, hey, we're going to switch this. And they were like the technician, the engineer's side, they properly switched the thing. And then somewhere along the way, it did not get communicated to the cosmonauts. So the cosmonauts were trained with the old way. Fuck. They just, they just didn't communicate it. And that cost these guys. The only good thing is that it wouldn't have mattered anyway. Like even if they, even if Patsy have found the right vent right away, it would not have mattered. This situation, there is no way these guys could have survived. Other Chris, this is for you. We're going to leave things on a note that will completely infuriate any engineer or technician or technologist listening. Anyone who knows GD and T really. I, I would I would like to preemptively thank you for making my day much worse. I love you for <laughs> it, and please continue. So here is how Vladimir Shadilov, one of the investigators, described the Soyuz build quality that he found. Quote. During an inspection, it was found that for both valves, the screws had not been sufficiently tightened, and the ball was free to jiggle about. When they examined the valves on already flown craft, including my Soyuz 10, it was noticed that the screws were torqued differently. The required force was 50 kilos, but some of the descent modules had valves torqued at 30 kilos, some at only 20, and one had valves whose screws were barely tightened. It's cold, the poor friends! <laughs> I'm sorry, I sh- I screamed into a pillow just there. No, no, no. That's a that's the that's a good like mic down. Uh, yeah, that kind was, of moment that was right a, there. That's the quality that we want for this. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're not peaking the mic. This is perfect. There were no spacecraft already flown in space with valves torqued to the proper degree. I could not believe this. It was an accident waiting to happen. So not only like in this investigation, they find out that every single Soyuz going back to Soyuz one has this exact same problem. It has only taken till now for it to actually kill anyone. Yeah. They're just fucking hand, they're hand, t- they're hand tightening this thing that will expose the crew to space. At a pr- so in a previous life, I was uh, doing to manufacturing. Okay, I thought you actually meant in a previous life. And I, I was going to say, like, most people say they were Napoleon. Ha uh, this guy can't escape Samsara. No, we, I, I, I had to deal with Aerojet Arachidon. And we, 
you know, told them, hey, one of our dishes decided to, you know, hand polish this surface. And we got the response back from them. Okay, cool. It doesn't need this. And if it doesn't, this will happen to the program. And for these parts, there were two of them. One was, if this part fails, then you'll have total measured failure. And if this part fails, you will have total measured failure and the craft will not survive. Because all these failures would happen at mash G everyone's dead. Oh, yeah. And there were hydraulic lines and oxygen, or what's it called? Oxygen lines? No. Something I can't remember. Oxidizer lines? Like if this is going into rocket stuff? Yeah. Yeah. We were working with Aerojet rocket which would this. Which would have just been oxygen, but still. Um, so this would be oxygen to the liquid form. But either way, everything's going so, horrific. And and even then, like because this has been a problem for so long, it's not like you can just point at one guy who fucked up. Like you can't just point at the guy who did the Soyuz eleven screws wrong. This is every single Soyuz. This is an institutional problem. This is something that like their entire um, and this is where I talk about the because th- I I work a lot in like quality engineering and I do systems engineering, which is just about like making sure that everyone works to the same kind of standard and does the right stuff and like. The fact that this is sending people to space to me is just like, yeah, fuck it. Put some fucking Loctite on it. It'll be good. Uh, I, I need more effort than I give to like my Ikea furniture when I put it together. Yeah, your Soyuz spacecraft should not have spare parts at the end. As someone who's done this for a living, just looking at this going, okay, cool. What's your substantiation for this? We wiggled it. Are you kidding me? That's going back. I'm amazed the Salyut didn't uh, fucking explode. Are you kidding? Considering I'm stuck that it, on was, the it was the one that was, it was it was hand wiggled. I have two sort of like finalish thoughts to add. One of them is more positive, and one of them I think is kind of sad. Which one do you want to hear first? Turn me into just an emotionless nub. Yeah, bad news first. Neutral to bad. I don't know. Um, so in in the uh, that interview article where. Uh, they're being interviewed right before the launch. They've just found out that they're going. One of the questions that I think it's Yuri Apinchenko who asks, um, he asks Patsayev, he says, does your family know that you're flying? Because you know, this is a last minute decision. And his response is, my mom, my wife, yes. Uh, nobody else knows. The kids don't know. Uh, for them, this is going to be a surprise. And like, I read that and I was like, oh. That's a terrible surprise. They would have they would have found out once they were in space because they they spent like a month up there. But it's still like so at least there's that. But it's like not not getting to, I guess, say like a real goodbye. That kind of sucks. That made me a little sad. Yeah, like I'm going to work and like that's I, all. I have, like, I have to imagine I couldn't find any specific stuff, but I have to imagine they talked over the radio like they were able to chat during the mission. Yeah, I was but curious like, about that to see if they had any like one if they had any direct communication like with their families or anything yeah but. i think it, it would have either been like they had the families to the mission control in crimea or they uh like kind of routed the mission the uh the telephone around yeah it's uh it's rough the the more positive thing uh that i was thinking is back to um when you were going through the journal entries just the diary the daily stuff and the part the, the part that i kind of made me feel i guess a little bit of a upswell of you know more positivity is from Volkov's diary where he's talking about started my duty. I'll be the first to see the globe instrument indicate 1000 orbits. Yeah. The historic event will occur during my time on duty. Simply unbelievable. Is that like in, in these space exploration stories in the shipwreck stories, you, we obviously like, because of the nature of the shows focus on what goes wrong, like all of the cynical stuff of like, what the hell is this person thinking? There's still those like those moments of wonder that these people I mean, these people still went to space. They spent, you know, a month in space and they got to see things that most of us never will. And it's like, yeah, it ends poorly, but it's it's interesting. And I think it is beneficial to think about like, yeah, like there was some stuff that went right. And there were some things that they got to experience and uh, really, I don't know, take take some things that will probably become common space nowadays. Mm-hmm. We, we we still have these people to look back upon that were the first. Oh, yeah. They were the first to mm-hmm. say, hey, from, you know, what, the 1960s, I was here. I lasted mm-hmm. this long in space. It's an immac- it, It's just amazing. And it's it's tragic that, like, and this isn't specifically about space, but things 
on, like institutions only learn the bad way. They only learn whenever stuff fucks up. As safe as a lot of launch systems are now, they are only that way because of all of the fuck ups along the way. And that does not mean that like all of those fuck ups were completely uh, not preventable. Like all of these problems were very apparent. People like with Soyuz 1, people were like writing paperwork. Technicians were saying like putting it in documents like, hey, this thing's fucking torqued uh, half as much as it should be. And then it just doesn't go anywhere. And uh, whenever the technicians are like, hey, we swapped the valve one and the valve two signs, no one told the cosmonauts. It's just this like, I don't know. I, I try I try and weigh my, you know, space is dangerous. There are actual, you know, like people will die pushing forward this science. My My acceptance of that with my understanding that I can still get mad at stupid mistakes, especially if they kill people. Yeah, something that comes up a lot on ours is that these things, you know, space travel, traveling over the across the ocean, they're dangerous when you do everything right. Mm -hmm. uh, so like those little those little things that you do have control over, you know, tightening these bolts enough. Um, it's like th those things simply have to be done because like there's going to be stuff that's out of your control. Freak stuff will happen. But yeah, it's it's like, you know, doing what you can do. I'm trying to think about like actual space freak accidents that didn't have massive like trails of this was obvious. Why didn't we prevent it? And like, mm -hmm. I don't know, maybe Columbia, I think, would be the only big, the only fatal one that really gets up there. Because like Soyuz 1, Soyuz 11 both had loads of warnings. Challenger had loads of warnings. Apollo 1 had loads of warnings. Columbia being the only one where like, even if they did identify the problem, I don't know if they could have gotten rescued once they were up there. Columbia just like lost a piece when they were launching yes. and then oh, that came right. back to bite them. It got a, it got a piece of the, the heat shield knocked off of the forward leading edge. Um, and then as it, I believe it was, it was noticed. I don't believe it was inspected after that point. They had uh, after they did EVAs and they had the Canadarm uh, kind of like inspect the heat shield to make sure there hadn't been any damage, but I don't, I don't believe they had a, I mean, we'll cover it whenever we get there. I don't know if they had a shuttle ready to go to like rescue them. I want to put the shuttle bat on the, uh, fallen astronaut plaque. <laughs> he deserves to be up there. What is this? The tailless bat? Our homie? This is the tailless bat that got atomized, uh, by a, a launch a few years ago. Oh. It, it was just it was just holding on to the the side of the the tank because it was nice and warm, uh, and then the rocket oh. started. Listen, our homie fell fear, but he still clung on. It's all he could do. Exactly, he don't, did don't what only this, Chris. He did what any human could do. And if Jeff Bezos wants to ask why the bat gets to be on the plaque and not him, because the bat isn't an astronaut, well, well, number one guillotine. Well, the, the bat already has wings. It deserves astronaut wings. Well, number one, the guillotine can't work in space because <laughs> now there's that, no that, gravity. But that's something that else. vampire bat may be a blood sucking parasite, but it's not as big of a blood sucking parasite. I think it's uh I think that's a good end part right there. Uh end blood sucking parasites. All right. So uh if we're doing our outro now, I have to for for the, the, the listener who skipped, I have to say. And then they landed and everyone was safe and fine. The end. Everyone uh, just skipped into the yonder. So yeah. Uh Tanner, Taylor, thank you so much for coming on the show and for uh, going on, a, I, I, I don't want to say it's an emotional roller coaster unless it's one of those roller coasters where you just go really high up and then drop really quick. <laughs> it's the roller coaster that you build in Roller Coaster Tycoon where you just turn the speed up and it just throws them <laughs> off the <laughs> oven. Oh, okay. We got right from, you know, we're having some fun into the roller coaster that just, you know, arrives the station with a cart of dead kids. Yeah, it, it goes, it goes missing and it turns up with everyone dead. Mm -hmm. Fuck. I just, re yeah, people might have skipped to this. I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> no, keep it in. We got the jarring shift of tone down a pad. Uh, so is there any place our very depressed audience can find your work now? Uh, yeah. Uh, as a podcast, we're in all the normal podcast places, your Apple, your Spotify, the whole, you know, the whole roster of those things. Uh, we do have a Patreon, um, 
normally on the show, we kind of tell a shipwreck story each week. Uh, the Patreon is more to explore some shipwreck or ship related things. Uh, $3 a month gets you a bonus episode. $5 a month gets you two bonus episodes. Um, we're pretty active on Twitter at beyond underscore breakers. We're also on Instagram. We're on Blue Sky. I think we're on threads. Uh, I think you're just automatically really on that from having an Instagram. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, so all the normal places, we're probably there in some capacity. So check us out. I know a lot of people have already checked out the show from the first part of this uh, coming out. Hell yeah. Um, so so welcome. Welcome for our new listeners. I was honestly surprised to like see someone. Not that I'm looking at this like transactions as like, well, a bigger show. Of course, <laughs> it's only going to go one way. But like, I was surprised to see someone that was an FTL fan going like, whoa, I'm going to I'm going to get shift over to this BTV <laughs> thing. I was just like, wait, we have people who can do that. <laughs> My dad decided to try a new podcast. Hell Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, this has been a lot of fun. So thank you for inviting yeah, absolutely. us. Absolutely, this has been fun. Don't don't lie to the audience like that. <laughs> Overall, it has been fun. Yeah, we'll we'll get you on our show as well. We'll find a find a space hey, crossover. Hey, you find a submarine crossover. <laughs> you got me immediately. Or a submarine. Yes, it'll just be two hours of him being activated. <laughs> hey, you want to talk about a special interest? You got me. <laughs> yeah, he's been playing submarine games this whole time. Uh, <laughs> okay, I will not have my honor besmirched, so I have been completely integrated. Immediately myself. leaves chat. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, all right. Uh, and thank you, audience, for um, whether you skip to this point or whether you listen through all of the horrible stuff. Thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want more of this, you can support us on Patreon. You can find our bonus episodes there uh, where we are currently reviewing bad space movies. Supporting us at any tier gets access to everything. Supporting at higher tiers gets uh, little call outs, which you should be hearing right now. Thank you to everyone who has signed up to support the show. And a big shout out to our top tier patrons, our cyborg cats, our Antifa croc, boss meowster, Matt and Spectre Cohen. Our space dogs are Ben L, Brandon M, Fractal Moonlight, Furious Luddite, John C, Oliver, Sparks, Tom M, Wingsmith and Zim. Albert Count 14. Thank you for listening to another episode of Failure to Launch. If you want to follow us, we are Failure to Launch on Blue Sky and FT Launch Pod on Instagram. We also post our episodes with visual aids at Failure to Launch Podcast on YouTube. All music was provided by DJ Danarchy. <laughs> <laughs>